to be the program director on uh, the development and the acquisition of this airplane, the F-16. Uh, we're very proud of this airplane and we think that it's going to be an important um, system for the United States, for our air forces, uh, for NATO, and in fact for the free world. There are some very striking aspects of this airplane and this program. And the first one that I think you should look at are these five flags that are painted on the front side of the fuselage. They represent a unique endeavor on the part of the United States and five of our NATO allies to develop this airplane in a consortium. It's something that's uh, really never been done by the United States before. Uh, and it's, an, I think, a new step in the uh, usefulness of the NATO alliance and a way to bind that alliance together uh, even more closely than it has been in the past. This program, I said, was unique. It started out in a unique way, uh, as a prototype. And what we here at Wright-Patterson attempted to do was to define for contractors uh, what it was that we wanted this airplane to do. And we gave them a, a very tough challenge. And then we said, now we're going to give you a lot of freedom and a little bit of money and we want you to go out and to uh, build us just the best possible system that can do that. And there were two contractors that started out initially in competition. Uh, one of them, the winner, General Dynamics. Uh, the other one was uh, Northrop out in the West Coast. Uh, they both built very fine fighter systems for us. We then flew those in a test program, and uh, all of this was done at very low cost. And because we gave them the freedom in the design to put together some of the advanced features that I'll talk about later, uh, you'll see that they really came up with uh, what has to be, I think, uh, a bit of art and a good bit of engineering. As I said, General Dynamics won, and they won with this lightweight version of a fighter which can be used to uh, counter uh, fighters in the air, and we in the Air Force call that an air-to-air -air, uh, mission. Or it can also be used to drop weapons on the ground and to support uh, uh, the U.S. Army in the field or the NATO armies in the field. And we in the Air Force call that an air-to-ground mission. And this one can really do both of these things and do both missions quite well. Some of the features that perhaps aren't obvious, uh, but which really make this system uh, work very well. The air intake uh, is placed very, very carefully and in such a way that it feeds and supports a very powerful engine inside. Uh, this, this engine, uh, made by Pratt & Whitney Aircraft, is one that really is the key to the power, the maneuverability, and uh, the heart of this fighting machine. That air intake is designed in such a way that you can flexibly fly at high altitude, at low altitude, uh, and at very slow speeds and at very high speeds above Mach 2, or twice the speed of sound, uh, without uh, a lot of complexity and a lot of cost. And that's a tough job for any designer to, at low cost, get this kind of flexibility in a weapon system. Some other that are a little bit more obvious, perhaps, 
are this system right in here, this strake it's called. And what this does, it's a special aerodynamic feature and it causes uh, greater lift to come across the, the wings of the aircraft. We can develop lift uh, even when we're maneuvering it at terribly uh, high G-loadings. In this case, high G-loadings uh, above nine. You know, when we say high G-loadings above nine, we mean that the, the pilot, when he's pulling the stick and when he's pulling that airplane in and making a very, very tight turn, the, the centrifugal force in the turn is forcing him down with nine times the pull of gravity. Now, we don't do that just to make it tough on the pilot. We do that so we can he can outmaneuver an enemy fighter. And uh, this airplane is uh, so maneuverable that it can, in fact, uh, uh, turn inside the constraints of the Pentagon building. The wing itself and the way it's blended into the body gives us additional lift for such a system. Uh, right here, you can see the air-to-air -air missiles, which are always flown and which are always in place here on the wings. And this particular location on the wings gives you, again, additional lift, a more efficient kind of an airframe. Instead of having a stick that we have in most fighter planes that uh, the pilot uses and that, that that controls the way the, the airplane flies, when he pulls it back, the airplane goes up. Uh, this is his most important uh, control mechanism. And on normal airplanes, those sticks are are connected to a whole series of hydraulic lines and a very complex way of going all the way back and moving the control surfaces like this tail or here, uh, this flapper on, or in, and uh, this tail here. And what that's a, a heavy weight uh, and it's a complicated piece of machinery. And what we borrowed from the space program uh, is what we call a fly-by-wire system. And that means that the stick is just a little teeny stick that he has over here. That goes through a computer. And that computer is always helping the pilot fly at the most efficient possible uh, position. And by doing that, uh, with this fly-by-wire system, once again, we can do some very special things, some that are very subtle. Uh, but the important result is that we can outmaneuver enemy air, any enemy aircraft that they've got now or that we see in the foreseeable future. Now, those are some of the technical features that I've talked about. Let me tell you, let me go back to those five flags and tell you something about uh, the way in which we're going to build this system. We've combined this, these technical features in a nice, simple way so that we can make a low-cost aircraft. And of course, this was one of our most important objectives, because if, when we can keep the cost down, that allows us within uh, a fixed budget to have a system that uh, we can buy more and therefore ensure superiority in numbers uh, in order to win a battle, as well as uh, superiority in terms of uh, uh, a qualitative sense with the one aircraft. And I mean by this, we've got to be able to have a large number of aircraft available in a real fight. Uh, the low cost clearly is a benefit to the U.S. taxpayer. It's also going to be a benefit to NATO and the other taxpayers. Let's call out these five flags. Obviously, we start off with ours. Uh, the second flag, and it represents the Kingdom of Belgium. Uh, the third one, Denmark. Here we have the Netherlands, and here we have Norway. Uh, we have, as part of my system program office, which has the international management responsibility for this weapon system, we have 20 officers from those four nations who are just part of our organization. Uh, they add a great understanding. They also add uh, a great amount of talent and a lot of excitement to the program. Uh, some time ago, when this consortium to build this aircraft was announced, uh, it was announced as the arms deal of the century. Uh, I think that there's a, a better way to describe it. Instead of the arms deal of the century, I think what it really is, is the, um, a new attempt and the most complex attempt that we've under, ever undertaken uh, at multinational uh, NATO uh, co-production. Remember I said that General Dynamics was the
prime contractor uh, and that Pratt & Whitney was the prime engine contractor. Those contractors are really leading a multinational effort to build this. Instead of building this in one production line in the United States, as we have in many systems, we're building it in three production lines in five countries with two engine production lines. We now have placed in Europe about $1.5 billion worth of contracts on this program. Uh, they'll be making uh, parts of the fuselage and assembling this aircraft in Belgium. They'll be making other parts of the aircraft and assembling it in the Netherlands. They'll be making electronics parts, engine parts in Denmark and Norway, as well as in the United States. This is the real challenge of this program, is to try to take this uh, multinational uh, industrial consortium and put it together in such a way that it's a benefit to the United States, it's a benefit to each one of our NATO allies that are participating, uh, and in fact, then becomes a financially viable thing to do. Uh, the United States will be buying over uh, 1,300 aircraft. Uh, the Europeans will be buying some 348. And then in addition to that, we've already uh, announced that Iran will be buying a significant number. And what that adds up to at this point in time is a $22 billion program. An important piece of the action will be in Europe. Uh, we call this a swing fighter, and by that we mean that it will complement uh, our principal air superiority or air-to-air -air aircraft, the F-15. Uh, it can do very well in that role, and it'll complement that with uh, lower-cost airplanes. It'll also complement our specialized aircraft that are supporting the Army. Uh, the A-10 supports uh, our Army, and it's an aircraft that's built especially for that job. But our airplane, with its flexibility, can do both missions. For uh, one of the first times on a very large scale, the United States and the NATO Air Forces will all be flying a standardized weapon system. That means that uh, American squadrons can land at a base in Norway or a base in Denmark or in any of the consortium countries. They can be supported by uh, their air forces. They can work together in a joint uh, uh, exercises with their air forces as they can work with ours. And this web of having a standardized system will greatly uh, strengthen the NATO alliance. So we've got to be able to produce this at low cost uh, and not exceed our portion of the budget. So low cost means two things. First of all, we have to produce the airplane. That's why the emphasis on simplicity and low cost in the design so that we can buy it initially cheaply. But more than that, we're also designing it in such a way as to minimize the life cycle costs. And what we mean by life cycle costs are the costs involved with spares, the numbers of people to maintain it over the full lifetime of the weapon system. So we're trying not to take just the short-sighted view. We're trying to say the total cost is important to us. It gives us this low-cost aircraft, which can give us the numbers then which can offset the tremendous numbers that the Soviet Air Force uh, has uh, in, their, in their inventory right now. We have to be very careful because the Soviets are making a major investment in all parts of their military machine. They have very large numbers of aircraft. The best way to counter that threat is to produce an airplane like this one, one that's economical, one that has advanced technology at low cost, uh, the kind of technology that will carry us well out into the future. Uh, this is an airplane that I think the United States can be proud of and one that uh, is going to be an important step for NATO as well as ourselves. Those magnificent men in their flying machines, they go up to the above.